The story continues with Rudius sitting depressed in a carriage, and a woman named Suzanne sitting across him asks if something is wrong, as he has been sighing a lot. Suzanne wonders what brings him up north, and she mentions that it's too dangerous a place for a child like him. Rudius states that he has no reason to answer that, and a girl named Sarah sitting with Suzanne gets angry at Rudius, and she states that Suzanne was just trying to be nice. Seeing her temper Rudius thinks that she is a lot like Eris, and he mentions that he is looking for his mother, a victim of the mass teleportation in Fitoa. Sarah then understands his foul mood, and Suzanne wonders how Rudius is planning to find her as the North is a big place. Rudius states that he will manage somehow, and Suzanne mentions that she will tell him a little about the North, and Rudius takes her up on her offer. She explains that most countries in the Northlands are poor, but the three great magical nations do well for themselves. The Kingdom of Renoa excels at training mages, the Duchy of Neris produces great magical implements, and the Duchy of Basharin specializes in arcane research. They are on their way to the last one right now, and the three kingdoms have formed an alliance, and they jointly advance the cause of magic. They then arrive at a city, and Rudius books a room at an inn for a month. He goes to his room and he remembers Eris, but he thinks that he is not here to deal with his heartbreak, and he needs to find his mom. He then goes to the Adventurer's Guild, and he disbands the dead-end party. Seeing this the others at the guild wonder if his party got wiped out, and Rudius then tries to take a job alone, but the receptionist states that taking on this job alone would be too hard for him. Rudius then starts to feel uncomfortable, and he calms down when he touches Eris's hairs. Suzanne overhears this argument, and she wonders if Rudius is recklessly trying to take a high-ranking job because he needs money to find his mother. She mentions that Rudius looks like he doesn't give a damn about anything, and this includes dying. She states that they should take on this job together, and she leads him to the rest of her party. Rudius still insists on working alone, but Suzanne and the others manage to get him to join their party temporarily. Suzanne then states that they should spend the day getting ready, and she asks Rudius to meet their party at the North Gate tomorrow morning. The next morning Rudius meets Suzanne's party, and he introduces himself, and he mentions that he can cast spells without incantations. Suzanne tries to shake his hand, but Rudius doesn't take her hand, and we see that after Eris's untimely farewell Rudius is now afraid to interact too much with people. On the way to their mission destination Suzanne tells him that the name of their party is Counter Arrow, and she is the subleader. Timothy the long-range mage introduces himself as the leader, and the healer introduces himself as Mimir. Patrice introduces himself as a close-range fighter, and Sarah states that she is a mid-range attacker. She mentions that she doesn't want Rudius here, and if he screws up and gets any of them killed then she will make him regret it. Seeing this Suzanne asks Sarah to give it a rest, as she might have to party with other adventurers someday, and she should learn to work with all sorts of people. At night the party makes a camp, and Timothy tells Rudius that the luster grizzlies they are here to hunt, have a weakness, and Rudius mentions that he knows that they can't see well in the dark. They then have a strategy meeting, and Suzanne tells everyone what parts they are going to play. Rudius then tries to suggest other ways to help the party after doing his part, but Sarah states that Rudius should just do what they tell them as he is new to this party, and he doesn't know how everyone moves. Rudius thinks that she is just like Eris in this respect as well, and Suzanne then asks Sarah to not spoil the mood, and Sarah leaves for a bit after apologizing. Afterwards, Timothy apologizes for Sarah, and he mentions that she is not a bad kid, but she is getting full of herself. He states that Rudius must be quite a mage, as the last guy whom he saw silent casting was a teacher in his school days. Rudius states that these skills won't bring his loved ones back, and he leaves. The scene then cuts to Sarah and Suzanne scouting the enemy, and Sarah states that there are 20 of them and they are all sleeping. They start the attack with Timothy's fire spell, and Rudius stalls them with earth magic while Timothy attacks with fire magic. Suzanne mentions that at this rate, they won't even need to fight up close, and Rudius then hears some footsteps. Some black grizzlies covered in mud then come there, and Timothy tells everyone to retreat seeing them. Rudius tries to fight them, but he thinks that he is sick of this, and he leaves himself to the mercy of the monsters. Suzanne saves him, and she asks everyone to run while she acts as a decoy, but they notice that they are surrounded. They all then decide to fight together, and we see that they are having a tough time. While they fight Rudius wonders why they are not running away, and he wonders why he feels so uneasy and frantic. Rudius then thinks that now he remembers why they are standing their ground, 
and he thinks that he has known this for ages, and he then goes to fight the grizzlies alone when the others are at their last legs. He uses a large fireball on them, and this defeats them all. Afterwards they skin the grizzlies, and while burning their bodies Suzanne thanks Rudius for saving them. Rudius states that it was nothing, and he shakes Suzanne's hand. Sarah also thanks him, and they then return to the guild. They cash in the skins for reward, and we see that the adventurers of the town don't like them too much, as they are outsiders. Timothy then treats everyone in the guild to a round of beer, and this mellows them up. The scene then cuts to Rudius at the inn, and he can't believe that he forgot to be serious about living. He thinks that he still hasn't lost everything, and he remembers everyone that he still has left. He thinks that he can't fall to pieces, and he burns the hairs of Eris, and he states that he will keep moving forward, and do what needs to be done. Few months then pass by, and Rudius has started working out. He mentions that he has been working as an adventurer, and building a reputation with the townsfolk, and the other adventurers, and his plan is to spread his name far and wide until the word reaches his mother. The scene then cuts to a party named Step Leader announcing the job they are taking to the whole guild, and they leave for their job. Rudius then looks for a quest, and a few adventurers thank him for helping them out earlier. Rudius thinks that he now has quite a reputation in this town, but most of the people know him with his nickname Quagmire. He thinks that making his name in every town will take a lot of time, but this is the only method he is right now. Rudius then takes a job to clean the city of snow, and while he does the job, we see that Sarah is watching him. After he returns to the guild from the job, Sarah intercepts him, and she wonders if he would like to join them for a job. Rudius thinks that he has worked quite a lot with Counter Arrow, and teaming with a single party doesn't really do much for his goal, but he can't deny them. He asks Sarah when they will be setting out, and Sarah mentions that Rudius should just say no if he is not interested. Suzanne and the others then come there, and they ask Rudius if he is coming, and Rudius mentions that he would love to. The scene then cuts to them at the Galgo ruins, and Timothy states that these ruins were built as a fortress during the Human Demon War. Rudius thinks that he has never seen anything like this before, and Sarah asks him to hurry up. Rudius then notices Sarah stumbling with his eye of foresight, and he catches her, but he accidentally gropes her chest, and Sarah asks him to watch his hands. Suzanne then notices a snow drake scale, and she mentions that their job is to gather all the scales that fall here. Rudius thinks that this is quite easy for an A-rank job, and Suzanne mentions that this is snow drake territory, so no one should go far past that statue. Afterwards Rudius guards his party members while they gather the scales, and he recognizes that the statue belongs to Kishirika. They then hear some kind of sound, and they are attacked by snow drakes. Rudius blocks their path with earth magic, but the snow drakes just climb over the wall. Rudius then uses ice magic to stall them, and he notices that his party members are gone. He gets surrounded by the snow drakes, and Sarah and Timothy attack the snow drakes from above. They all then fight, and Suzanne states that they don't seem to be after them, and she asks everyone to only fight those who come for them. The leader of the step leader party then comes there, and he starts slaying the snow drakes, and seeing this counter arrow also takes the offensive. Together they manage to wipe out all the snow drakes, and the leader of the step leader party named Soldat Heckler then punches Timothy for trying to steal their prey, and Suzanne tells him that they weren't told that someone else would be working here. Soldat mentions that they announced it in front of the whole guild, and Rudius states that Soldat did say something about exterminating a snow drake infestation in Ilbrin Cave. Suzanne mentions that Ilbrin Cave is a day's journey from here, and Timothy asks her to calm down. They then find out that the depths of Ilbrin Cave and the Galgo ruins became linked somehow, and monsters from there spilled over into this cave. Soldat finds out that Counter Arrow is here on a different job, and he apologizes for punching Timothy but he mentions that these drakes are their prey, so he will only let Counter Arrow have one of them. Counter Arrow then heads back after taking their prize, and they celebrate. Sarah states that Rudius was really lucky to survive a run-in with these many monsters, and Rudius mentions that he was not lucky, he was saved by the rest of them. Sarah states that any other party would have left him behind, and Rudius thanks her for the save. Sarah mentions that Timothy and Suzanne deserve all the credit, and Suzanne states that Sarah was the one who rushed to help before any of them. This makes Sarah embarrassed, and she mentions that she was just returning the favor from the last time Rudius helped them. Timothy states that it was all good as they did manage to make good money, 
and Sarah mentions that it would have been better if Step Leader didn't show up. She states that they have gotten big heads as they are the strongest party in the guild, and she mentions that they should just stick to their labyrinths. Soldat then comes there, and he apologizes for his earlier behavior. He states that Timothy's face just pisses him off, and he can't stand a guy who does nothing after taking a punch. He mentions that sometimes a man has to fight, and Timothy states that he will keep that in mind. Soldat then mentions that Timothy is okay, but Quagmire is the worst. He wonders why he is always so worried about what others think of him, and he states that this grin of his makes him sick. He mentions that he doesn't know what Rudius has been through, but he knows that he is just running away, and he hates seeing brats like him. Rudius states that he will do his best to stay out of Soldat's sight, and Soldat mentions that Rudius shouldn't act so high and mighty. He wonders what he wants to prove by refusing money for making a reputation for himself, and he asks Rudius to drop dead as he is sick of seeing him, and someone then takes Soldat away. We see that Rudius has a miserable look on his face, and the next day Soldat notices Rudius in the guild again. He wonders if Rudius is waiting for another crappy job, and Rudius mentions that he has his reasons. Soldat states that he is just half-assing his way through life, and he leaves. Counter Arrow then enters the guild, and Rudius asks them if something is wrong. Suzanne states that Mimir and Sarah are dead, and Timothy mentions that Mimir is dead, but Sarah just separated from them. He states that they might still be able to find her if they leave now, and Suzanne mentions that they should wait until the blizzard subsides. They regret leaving Sarah behind, and Rudius asks them where they lost her. They state that it was in the forest to the west, and they were attacked by a snow buffalo. Rudius then leaves to find Sarah on his own, and on his way he wonders if he is doing this to make himself feel better. He then notices a snow buffalo, and he kills it with earth magic. He wipes out every snow buffalo he comes across, and he wonders what he is going to do once he finds Sarah. He then finds Mimir's bones in the piles of leftover garbage at the snow buffalo's nest, and he takes some of Mimir's hair with him. He notices one of Sarah's earrings among the pile of bones, and he thinks that she might be dead. He then burns the bones of all of the preys of the snow buffaloes, and he is then attacked by a tray ant. He notices that the tray ant is holding Sarah captive, and he saves her using his fire magic. They then go to a cave, and Rudius heals Sarah. He asks her if she is fine, and Sarah states that she is, and she wonders why Rudius is alone, and Rudius mentions that her party mentioned that she went missing, so he came to search for her. Sarah then asks him if everyone is alright, and she finds out that Mimir is dead. Sarah then thanks Rudius for saving her, and hearing her words Rudius feels like he has been forgiven for everything he has done. He was the one who saved her, but he feels like it was the other way around. Sarah then reunites with her party, and Timothy thanks Rudius for saving Sarah. He wonders if there is anything he can do to thank him, and Rudius states that this won't be necessary as they have already done too much for him. They then head inside the city, and before Rudius leaves, Sarah states that she will see him tomorrow, and we see that she has a face of a maiden in love. Rudius then returns to his inn, and he thinks that today he can finally sleep soundly. The scene then cuts to Rudius partying after completing another successful quest with Counter Arrow. Rudius mentions that ever since that night he has been working almost constantly with Counter Arrow, and his reputation has grown, and him and Sarah have gotten closer. Rudius then talks to Sarah and she mentions that aside from a bow, she can also use a knife, and she uses it to do repairs on her gear, but the blade is getting awfully chipped. She is thinking of buying a new one, and she asks Rudius to accompany her to buy one. Rudius agrees, and he realizes that she just asked him out on a date. The scene then cuts to them sightseeing around town the next day, and they go to a blacksmith to buy a knife. Rudius helps her pick out a knife suitable for her, and they then go to a bar. Afterwards Sarah states that she is feeling a little tipsy, and she mentions that she always winds up drinking too much when they are together. She states that it must be because she feels safe when she is around Rudius, and Rudius wonders if he should put his hand around her. He thinks that he should go for it, as it's high time he put his past behind him, but he changes his mind, and he offers to escort Sarah back to her inn. Sarah states that she would like to talk for a little longer, and she wonders if they can go to Rudius's inn. Rudius wonders what he should do, and he decides to go with the flow. The scene cuts to them in Rudius's room, and Sarah asks Rudius to sit with her. Rudius does so, 
and Sarah thanks him for saving her that day, and she gives Rudius the go-ahead. They start kissing, and they get naked, but Rudius notices that he doesn't have an erection. He thinks that this is why he has been feeling off lately, and he wonders how long he has been like this. Sarah then tells Rudius that she was just trying to thank him for saving her, and she asks him to not get the wrong idea, and she leaves telling him that he is the worst. The scene then cuts to Rudius drinking in a tavern while wallowing in his worries, and Soldat comes there. He wonders why Rudius is so down, and he insults Rudius. Rudius then hits Soldat, and he keeps on punching him, asking him why he always keeps trying to pick fights with him. He keeps on hitting him, and he stops saying that he should just forget it as this is the end for him. He mentions that he doesn't care if they laugh at him, and he starts crying. Soldat then apologizes to him, and he mentions that he is willing to listen to his troubles, and they will figure something out together. Soldat finds out that Rudius got dumped by a girl because he can't get it up, and he asks Rudius if he knows what could have caused it. Rudius explains that there was this girl he liked, and they both did it, but afterwards she left him. Rudius cries wondering why Eris left him, and Soldat states that now that they know the cause they should get Rudius fixed up. Rudius wonders how, and Soldat tells him to leave it up to him. They then go to the pleasure quarters, and they enter a brothel, and Rudius chooses a girl named Elise who looks kind of like Eris. She tries everything she can to help him, but it doesn't work out. She mentions that Rudius seems afraid of girls, and it might work out if he knows a woman that he won't fear, someone he knows would never turn on him. Soldat wonders if Rudius knows anyone like that, and Rudius states that he doesn't. Elise states that such relationships can't be rushed, and Soldat mentions that Rudius should just drink up tonight. The scene then cuts to them leaving the pleasure quarters in the morning, and Soldat mentions that Rudius should not try to rush things. He wonders if Rudius just went a little too quick with Sarah, and he mentions that she might have been all ready to go, but maybe he needed a little more time to prepare himself emotionally. Rudius states that Sarah told him that it was only out of obligation, and Soldat mentions that this can't be true as it looked like she was quite into Rudius. He states that Rudius should see her again, and talk it out, and Rudius mentions that he will go see her in the evening or tomorrow. He states that he doesn't care if it doesn't work out, and he mentions that he doesn't want a woman who was built like a kid. He states that a woman ought to be stacked like Elise, and Soldat notices that Sarah is right behind Rudius, and he tries to stop Rudius, but Rudius keeps trash-talking about Sarah. Sarah then slaps Rudius, and she asks him to never see her again, and she leaves after returning the knife Rudius bought her. Rudius tries to kill himself using that knife, but Soldat stops him, and he tells him to go after her and explain himself. Rudius states that he doesn't care anymore, and Soldat thinks that maybe Rudius should go home for a while, but he finds out that his parents are too far, and he wonders if Rudius would like to join their party. Soldat states that they are going to the Duchy of Nerys as a huge labyrinth turned up there, and Rudius wonders why he would even make that offer, as he is supposed to hate him. Soldat mentions that he does hate Rudius's creepy smile and his good manners, but now he knows what's at his heart. He states that he can accept why Rudius acts that way, and he has no more reason to hate him. Rudius then thinks that Soldat is a lot nicer than he thought, and he agrees to join him. Elsewhere Alina Lees overhears some men talking that a mage named Rudius took out a dragon recently, and this piques her interest, and she asks the men more about this. The men mention that they don't know anymore, and Alina Lees states that she will let them have a round with her if they can remember. The men then mention that they heard that he is in Basharin's third city, named Pippin, and Alina Lees thinks that she finally found him. The scene then cuts to Rudius traveling with the step leader party, and he scouts monsters for them. He notices a pack of luster grizzlies, and he mentions that they are heading straight for them. The step leader party then spreads around, and Soldat asks Rudius to back them up. Rudius then uses earth magic to trap the monsters, and the rest of the party slays them easily. A red dragon then comes there, and they realize that the grizzlies were actually running away from it. Soldat then asks Rudius how he couldn't notice the dragon, and Rudius mentions that he couldn't see it through the cloud of snow that the grizzlies were kicking. The red dragon then kills some of the members of the party, and Soldat orders everyone to retreat. Everyone retreats while Rudius distracts the dragon, and Rudius then uses earth magic to capture and kill the dragon. Everyone is surprised to see this, and the scene then cuts to them in a nearby city. Some of the party members state that Rudius is even better than they heard, 
and Soldat mentions that Rudius should join their party for real now. Rudius states that he can't do that because after making a name for himself in this country he will move to another, as he still needs to search for his mother. The scene then cuts to Rudius praying to Roxy's panties, and the next day after doing some exercise, he goes to get some food. Alina Lise comes there, and she mentions that she has finally tracked Rudius. Rudius thinks that she doesn't ring any bells, and he wonders what she is after. Alina Lise introduces herself, and she mentions that she used to be in the same party as Paul, and she is also a friend of Roxy. Rudius is surprised to find this out, and he asks her where his master is right now. Alina Lise states that this can wait, and she mentions that she has heard that Rudius managed to take down a red dragon single-handedly. Rudius states that the dragon was already on its last legs, and Alina Lise mentions that Rudius is manlier than she thought while touching his chest. She then tries to kiss Rudius, and she notices the pendant that Silphy gave him. She asks him if this was given to him by an elf, and Rudius states that it was, and Alina Lise shows her that she also has a similar pendant. She then backs off, and Rudius states that she shouldn't tease him so much. Alina Lise mentions that she never teases men, and she states that she just doesn't want to become Paul's daughter-in-law. Rudius then asks her if she has business with him, and Alina Lise states that she has brought good news for him, and she tells him that Rudius's mother is in the labyrinth city of Rapan near the center of Begarit continent. The next day while doing his daily exercise routine Rudius thinks that traveling to Rapan on foot will take him around a year, and he decides to stay here for the time being, as it's winter right now. Rudius recalls that Alina Lise also told him that there is no need for him to hurry as the other members of her party including Paul might have already reached Begarit by now. He thinks that he has nothing to worry about if Roxy is there and while on a run he notices that Alina Lise is indulging in pleasure even this early in the morning. Rudius explains that she brings different men into her room every day, and he has no problems with this, in fact he would like to join in, but for the last two years he has been suffering from erectile dysfunction. He states that he has given up, and he has no hope for a relationship anymore. He thinks that he doesn't want to face another betrayal, and the next day he notices Soldat leaving from Alina Lise's room. Soldat tries to explain himself, but Rudius tells him that he doesn't mind, and he thinks that Alina Lise has already slept with a few other guys in Soldat's party. A few days later Rudius receives a letter from the vice principal of the Renoa University of Magic, and after reading the letter he finds out that the university wants to accept him as a special student, as they are impressed with his current reputation. The letter explains that special students are excused from both tuition and regular classes, and they may use their libraries and other facilities to conduct any research they want. Rudius wonders what he should do about this, and he thinks that he is interested as he has hit a wall in his magic training, but he needs to find out that it's legit. Rudius then asks Conrad about the contents of the letter as he is a former student of the University of Magic, and he finds out that the letter is indeed real. Conrad tells Rudius that the university reaches out to people like him who have a lot of mana, and can use weird spells, as when they become famous later, it's good publicity for the university. Conrad states that Rudius should accept their offer, and Rudius thinks that going to this school with Sylphie was his original goal, and he wonders where Sylphie is right now. Alina Lise then states that it would be better if Rudius goes to this school instead of joining Paul, as Paul will be able to bring his mother back to Azura, and he can visit them when they are back. Rudius mentions that he knows that Alina Lise is only saying this because she doesn't want to see Paul, and he decides to reject the invitation to the university. The scene then cuts to Rudius meeting the man-god in his dream, and the man-god states that it's been two years since their last meeting. Rudius mentions that he called for the man-god a bunch of times when he was looking for Zenith, but he didn't even show up once. The man-god states that this isn't easy for him, and he mentions that someone did manage to find her in the end. Rudius states that he had no idea that his master was also looking for her, and he thinks that he can't wait to see her. The man-god wonders if Rudius is sure that he wants his master to see him like this, as he hasn't achieved anything since the last they met, and even his magic hasn't advanced much. The man-god mentions that Rudius should go to the University of Magic and shape up, and Rudius wonders if this is more of the man-god's advice. The man-god states that it is, and he mentions that Rudius should listen to him this time as he is going to regret it if he goes to Begarit. Rudius wonders why, but the man-god doesn't explain this to him, and the man-god then tells Rudius to enroll in the University of Magic and investigate the mass teleportation in Fitoa there, 
and doing this will help him regain his manly potency and pride. Rudius then wakes up, and he notices that he is in bed with Alina Lees, but there is still no reaction from his lower body. Rudius then says goodbye to the step leader party, and he leaves for the kingdom of Renoa with Alina Lees. After days of traveling, they arrive at the kingdom of Renoa, and Rudius asks Alina Lees to wait for him while he talks with the person who sent the letter. Alina Lees states that she will be attending the university with Rudius, and Rudius wonders if she has any interest in magic. Alina Lee states that she doesn't, but she has developed an interest in boys of his age. Rudius then explains that during their travels he found out that Alina Lee's has a curse that will kill her unless she sleeps with men on a regular basis. The scene then cuts to them meeting a teacher named Genius in the academy, and Genius wonders if Rudius's presence here means that he wants to attend their academy. Rudius states that he does, and he would like to accomplish a great number of things while he is here. Genius mentions that Rudius will have to participate in a little test before he can attend, and while heading to the location of the test, he finds out that in this academy they also teach non-magical disciplines. Rudius then arrives at the testing site, and Genius mentions that he would like for Rudius to demonstrate his silent casting skills. He states that they have another silent caster here, and he introduces Rudius to Fitz who is actually Silphy disguised as a man. Rudius doesn't recognize her, and he introduces himself to Fitz. Genius states that the test will be a duel between the two of them, and the two of them then fight. Rudius uses Disturb Magic to disrupt Fitz's magic, and he manages to beat him with his next spell. Fitz wonders how Rudius did that, and Rudius tells him that he used Disturb Magic, and he then makes a show of good sportsmanship by giving Fitz a hand to get up. Afterwards Rudius started staying in the university dorms, and he found out that as a special student he is exempt from paying tuition and attending most of the classes. As long as he attends homeroom once a month, he is free to do whatever he wants. Alina Lees then shows Rudius her new uniform, and Rudius tells her that she will have a better time picking up men if her skirt were a little shorter. Alina Lees heeds his advice, and they then attend the entrance ceremony. The student council president named Ariel gives a speech at this occasion, and she introduces herself as the second princess of Azura, and she gives a standard lecture about the rules and regulations of the university. Rudius thinks that normally people would find this boring, but she seems to have charisma. After the speech Rudius goes to his class, and he notices Zenoba there. Zenoba is excited to see Rudius again, and a beast girl named Linnea mentions that she doesn't like Rudius, and Linnea tells Zenoba to bring Rudius to her. Rudius wonders if Zenoba is getting bullied, and he thinks that Zenoba should be strong. Rudius then greets Linnea, and he tries to act humble, thinking that he will just avoid her whenever possible. Linnea likes his humble attitude, and Rudius finds out that Linnea is actually Gaius's daughter. He then meets another beast girl in the class, and she introduces herself as Persina. Rudius then takes his seat and a mage sitting in front of him introduces himself as Cliff Grimoire. He tells Rudius about his qualifications in magic, and he mentions that he has heard that Rudius is also a swordsman along with being a mage. Rudius wonders who told him this, and Cliff states that it was Eris. Rudius asks him if she is here, and Cliff states that she is not, and Rudius wonders where he met her. Cliff doesn't reply to him, and Zenoba tells Rudius that aside from them, there is a girl called Seven Star in this class, but she rarely attends classes. She is even exempt from monthly homerooms, and she spends most of her time in her laboratory. Rudius thinks that she must be quite talented, and Zenoba states that Rudius will meet her eventually. After class Rudius goes to the library, and he tries to look into the mass teleportation like the man god said. He meets Fitz while in the library and he apologizes for humiliating him the other day. Fitz asks Rudius to not worry about that, and he wonders what brings Rudius here. Rudius states that he is here to look into the mass teleportation, and Fitz wonders why. Rudius states that he used to live in the Fitoa region, and this disaster sent him to the demon continent. Fitz is surprised to hear this, and Rudius states that it took him three years to get back, and his family was found by that time, but one of his old friends still seems to be missing. Fitz wonders if Rudius came here to investigate this, and Rudius states that he did. Fitz then refers a book to Rudius to help him in his research, and he leaves. Rudius is glad that Fitz is not nursing a grudge against him, and he thinks that he seems like a great guy. 
The scene then cuts to Rudius having lunch with Zenoba, and Zenoba states that he has been practicing his earth magic, and Rudius mentions that they should make a figurine together once he is settled in. A man then comes there, and he tries to talk to Rudius. Rudius introduces himself, and the man states that he has heard about him from Fitz, and he has also heard that Rudius is quite forgetful. Rudius wonders what he is forgetting, and the man leaves after introducing himself as Luke Noto's Grey Rat, and Rudius thinks that the Notos are Paul's branch of the family, and this must make him his cousin. Zenoba explains that Luke is from the higher echelons of Azurin nobility, and his true purpose here is to guard Princess Ariel. Rudius wonders why Ariel is here in the first place, and Zenoba states that he has heard that she lost her struggle to become heir to the throne, and used her studies as a pretext to flee. She brought Luke as her knight, and he might also be insurance in case she tries to make another play for the throne. Fitz is her other bodyguard, and nobody knows anything about him except for the fact that he is a white-haired elf. Rudius then returns from the library, and while heading to the dorms he catches a pair of panties falling from the girls' dorms. A girl notices him with the panties and she screams saying that there is an underwear thief here, and all the girls from the dorms surround Rudius. Fitz then comes there and he explains that he dropped those panties while drying them up, but a girl named Goriate still doesn't let Rudius go. She states that they need to make an example out of him, and Fitz then threatens her into letting Rudius go. Afterwards Fitz apologizes for getting Rudius into trouble, and Rudius states that it wasn't his fault, and he thanks him for the help. Fitz mentions that anyone would do the same, and Rudius thinks that this is not true, and he thinks that Fitz really is a good guy, and he will call him senpai from now on to show his respect. Rudius then thanks Fitz again, and Fitz states that it's really strange being thanked by Rudius, and Rudius wonders why. Fitz states that he won't tell, and this makes Rudius's heart skip a beat. The scene then cuts to Rudius doing his daily morning training, and he thinks that school life is quite monotonous. Every day after doing his training he goes to his room to do some magic drills, and he needs to practice figure making as Zenoba keeps begging him to teach him this. Afterwards he eats breakfast with Zenoba, and he mentions that Alina Lee spends quality time at school during the day, and more out of town at night. In the afternoon Rudius takes basic classes in healing and barrier magic, and when he is not in class, he researches the teleportation in the library. He mentions that he has gone through a lot of books, but since teleportation magic is taboo, he hasn't found many details. His best source of information is the book that Fitz mentioned, and he mentions that now he has started to settle into his new life, but there is still no updates on the disease he is suffering from. The scene then cuts to Rudius researching in the library and Fitz joins him. Rudius thinks that he is one of the few guys he gets along with, and he notices that Fitz is reading a book on teleportation. Fitz mentions that someone he knows also went missing in that disaster, but he recently learned that he is alive. Fitz then mentions that he would like to help Rudius research the mass teleportation, and Rudius states that he would be delighted to have his help. They then shake hands, and Rudius starts to blush, and he wonders if he is getting attracted to men. He thinks that this can't be, and afterwards on their way out of the library, Rudius thinks that he has been getting close to Fitz lately, but there is a lot he doesn't know about him. Rudius then asks Fitz why he always wears sunglasses, and Fitz states that he has his reasons, but he can't explain them. Rudius then asks him what part of the dorms he lives in and Fitz tells him that he lives in the girls' dorms since he guards Princess Ariel. Rudius wonders if this doesn't cause any problems, and Fitz states that he has permission for it. Rudius then asks Fitz if he has been casting silently ever since he was a child, and Fitz states that long ago his master rescued him, and he started learning from him. He is an amazing person, and he still looks up to him. Rudius thinks that he would love to meet that guy, and Fitz mentions that this will work out, and he smiles. Rudius then wonders why his heart always goes a flutter when he sees Fitz smile, and he thinks that he is sure that he doesn't swing that way. Fitz then leaves, and Rudius thinks that he met Fitz by following the man god's advice, and this might lead him to eventually finding a cure for his illness. The scene then cuts to Zenoba asking Rudius to teach him to sculpt figures and he wonders why Rudius keeps refusing to begin his instruction as he gave him his word. Rudius states that making figures is not what he came here for, but he has put off Sonoba for long enough, and he decides to teach Sonoba. After a few days of training Rudius finds out that Sonoba has no talent for magic, and he mentions that they should try another way. He shows Sonoba how to sculpt figures by hand, but Sonoba fails to do this as well, 
as his super strength gets in the way of this. Afterwards Rudius tells Fitz about this, and Fitz mentions that he has an idea. He states that there was a similar case in the Azurin capital, and they wanted to do something they lacked the talent for. They got a slave to do this for them, and Rudius thinks that this might work, and he decides to visit the slave market with Sonoba. Fitz then states that he also has some time off on his next break, and realizing what he wants, Rudius asks him to join them, and Fitz agrees. The next day after they get through with the introductions, the three of them go to a slave shop. Inside the shop Fitz notices that all the slaves are naked, and Rudius thinks that Fitz might be a virgin if he is bothered by that. Fitz wonders how Rudius is alright with this, and Rudius states that Fitz will also get used to this after he has some experience. Fitz wonders if this means that Rudius has experience, and Zenoba mentions that warriors are no use to them, and they need someone gifted with magic and good with their hands. Rudius thinks that dwarves are known for their dexterity, and Fitz mentions that Rudius should pick someone who doesn't know magic, if he plans on teaching them. Rudius wonders why, and Fitz mentions that it's because learning to cast without incantation is easier if they start young, and starting around 5 or so years old does wonders for one's mana capacity. Rudius then talks to a merchant revealing the kind of the slave they want, and the merchant states that they don't get many dwarves that are so young. He then checks out the list, and he finds out that he does have a six-year-old dwarf girl. She is not in the best shape due to malnutrition, but feeding her will fix that. She can't speak human, and she can't read, and Rudius asks to see her. They then meet the dwarf girl, and Rudius tries to talk to her, but she doesn't reply. The merchant tries to whip her, but Rudius stops him, and he mentions that she has the hopeless face of someone who wants to die. Rudius thinks that his eyes also used to look the same as her, at one point, and he had given up on everything. Rudius then asks the girl if she wants to die, and he mentions that he can end her life if this is what she wants, and he thinks that he can't bring salvation to her. He can buy her, and give her a job, but that won't be salvation. He can't save her by forcing her to do something against her will, and he asks the girl to say something. The girl then states that she doesn't want to die, and Rudius thinks that this is enough for now. He buys her, and the scene cuts to him feeding her in a restaurant. He asks the child her name, and she tells him some weirdly big name, and Fitz explains that dwarves don't get proper names until they turn seven. They then name her Juliet, and they decide that she will live with Zenoba and wait on him. During the day Rudius teaches her to speak human and use incantation less magic, and slowly they start making progress in their figure-making plan. The scene then cuts to Fitz waking up one morning and he goes for a walk after freshening up. He states that he always starts his day by running around Sharia, the city of magic, and this helps him learn about the layout of the land. He mentions that his lessons are boring, and they are basically the retelling of things that he already learned from Rudius. He mentions that the princess is eager to learn, and he prefers dedicated positive people like her. He then goes out into the town with the princess and Luke, and the princess thinks that the roads in Sharia are really complicated. Luke explains to her that the city was built like a maze because its location was really vulnerable to invasions, and the princess can't believe that Luke has been paying attention to his lessons. Luke states that he heard this from a girl he dated recently, and Ariel hopes that playing the field doesn't get Luke stabbed in the back. Luke states that he can't help it as he has Noto's blood in his veins, and hearing this Fitz wonders if Rudius is also crazy about girls as he also has Noto's blood in him. He wonders if Rudius will chase girls even after he is married and he thinks that this might be the case as his father also did it. At night Fitz thinks that his relationship with Rudius is all he has been thinking about lately, and he gets embarrassed realizing what he is hoping for. Afterwards Rudius explains that a month has passed since Juliet arrived, and he assigned her training exercises as an experiment. He let her cast one incantation to start the day, and he then had her conjure lumps of clay without speaking, and with this she managed to learn silent casting in a month. He states that Juliet is a smart girl, and Zenoba seems to take care of her quite well. He mentions that all slaves are marked with special spells so they can't escape, but Juliet isn't a slave she is like his apprentice. One day Zenoba shows Juliet the Ruijured figurine, and he tells her what's so great about this, and Rudius asks Zenoba what happened to the Roxy figurine. Zenoba tries to tell him that he left it back in Chiron, but Rudius doesn't believe him, and Zenoba states that he has it with him. Rudius asks him to bring it out, and Zenoba shows him the figurine. 
Rudius notices that it's in pieces and he asks Sinoba to explain this. Rudius gets mad seeing a figurine resembling her master in pieces, and Zenoba explains that he lost a duel to Linnea and Persina, and they each wagered something precious. He asks Rudius to forgive him, and Rudius mentions that he should have told him this earlier. We see that he is still angry, but his anger has been diverted towards the beast girls instead. He thinks that those girls aren't going to get any mercy from him, and he states that they should teach them a lesson. The scene then cuts to Rudius confronting the Beast Girls with Zenoba, and they realize that Rudius is here for a fight. They mention that Zenoba should be taking his revenge himself, instead of involving this first year, and they wonder if he wants his other doll smashed as well. Zenoba then tries to face them, but Rudius stops him, and he asks the Beast Girls if they always gang up on people like this. He tells them that they can't do anything alone, and he tries to taunt them into fighting, and Linnea takes the bait. She attacks Rudius, and Rudius uses some dirt to blind Persina, and he asks Zenoba to take care of her. Rudius then defeats Linnea easily, and he knocks her out. Meanwhile he notices that Zenoba is chasing around Persina, and he creates mud to slip her up, and he knocks her out as well. Rudius and the others then tie up the girls, and the scene cuts to the girls waking up, and they notice that they are tied up. Rudius thinks that he might be able to get over his ED with this opportunity, and he grabs Persina's breast, but it doesn't work at all. Rudius then asks them if they know why they are in this predicament, and Persina mentions that she doesn't remember doing anything. Zenoba then shows them the broken Roxy figurine, and they wonder what this doll has to do with this. Rudius tells them that this doll belongs to the god who helped him experience the outside world, and they smashed it to pieces. He also shows them Roxy's panties, and he asks them if they have anything to say. Persina states that it was Linnea who stomped on that doll, and the two of them then argue, shifting the blame to each other. Rudius tells them that they are both guilty, and he wonders how he should punish them as the figurine they destroyed is totally fixable. The scene then cuts to Rudius asking Fitz for some advice about this, and Fitz can't believe that Rudius has two girls tied in his room. Rudius clarifies that he hasn't done anything sexual to them, and he states that he wants to punish them in a way that will teach them a lesson, satisfy him, and won't leave a grudge. Fitz states that this is a tricky problem, but he comes up with an idea nonetheless. The scene then cuts to Rudius returning to his room, and he notices that the girls have peed themselves, as they had no choice because they were tied up. Fitz and Rudius take care of their wet clothes, and they untie them. They mention that they are willing to do anything unless it's not something drastic, and they start treating Rudius like their boss, and they ask him to let them return to their room as they haven't had anything to eat since yesterday evening. Fitz mentions that they don't sound sorry enough, and the girls state that this is none of his business. Seeing this Rudius gets angry at them, and he asks them to sit. He then tells Fitz to go ahead and do his thing, and Fitz marks both of their faces with some ink. He mentions that this ink is used by a certain tribe to mark their bodies, and the right incantation can make it permanent. If they don't listen to Rudius, he is going to make these marks permanent, and he asks them to keep their faces like this all day tomorrow, and then he will remove the paint. Afterwards Linnea asks Rudius what kind of training he did to keep track of their movements, and Rudius mentions that he just followed his master's teaching. They wonder who his master is, and Rudius states that it's Ghislaine. The girls are surprised to find this out, and they leave Rudius's room after apologizing for his destroyed figurine. Rudius then states that the girls are going to be in trouble if someone else knows the incantation for making that ink permanent, and Fitz states that it was just a lie, and that was just cheap paint for magic circles. Fitz then notices the temple in which Rudius keeps Roxy's panties, and he tries to see what's inside that, but Rudius stops him. He mentions that Fitz can't see this, and he tells him that he can look at everything else. Fitz then checks out Rudius's bed by lying down on it, and she wonders if Rudius wants to see his whole face. Rudius states that he does, but Fitz mentions that he can't show it to him, as he is under orders from Princess Ariel to keep it hidden, and he then leaves. Afterwards Rudius feels like there would be no turning back if he had seen Fitz's face just now. The scene then cuts to Rudius, Linnea and Persina making a racket in class, and Cliff gets angry at them for this, and he mentions that they shouldn't come to class if they are just going to goof off. Rudius apologizes to him, and the scene then cuts to Cliff seeing Alina Lees on his way back to the dorms, and she captures his heart. Afterwards Rudius notices some guys beating on Cliff, 
and they run away when he confronts them, as they know of his reputation as the quagmire. Rudius asks Cliff if he is all right, and Cliff thanks him. Rudius thinks that he thought that Cliff was going to get angry at him, and he wonders why he hates him in the first place. Some days then pass by, and one day Cliff talks to Rudius privately. He tells him that there is a girl he likes, and Rudius wonders what he is getting at. Cliff tells him that it's Alina Lees, and he tells Rudius about all the things that he likes about her. Rudius can't believe that he has fallen for her, and Cliff explains that those guys who were beating him yesterday were spreading scandalous rumors about Alina Lees, saying that she would spend a night with any boy in the school. He tried to stop them, and Rudius thinks that they weren't lying. He wonders why Cliff is telling him this, and Cliff states that he wants him to introduce them, as he knows that the two of them know each other. The scene then cuts to Rudius filling in fits on the entire situation, and asking his advice. He mentions that he is not sure about introducing the two of them, and Fitz asks Rudius how he feels about that girl. Rudius states that he has nothing against her, but he would never date her. Fitz mentions that just because Rudius doesn't see her that way, it doesn't mean that Cliff also won't, and he states that he can understand how Cliff feels as he has someone he likes as well. He mentions that Rudius should introduce them because it's hard when you can see someone, but can't tell them how they feel. Rudius states that this might lead to trouble down the road, and Fitz mentions that it would be up to them to figure out. The scene then cuts to Rudius introducing Cliff to Alina Lees, and he mentions that Cliff wanted to get to know her, so he brought him along. Cliff asks Alina Lees to consider a personal relationship with him, and Alina Lees talks to Rudius privately, thinking that he is here to pimp his upperclassmen. Rudius explains to Alina Lees what's going on, and Alina Lees thinks that a serious guy like this could be a problem. She mentions that she can't stick with just a single guy due to her curse, and Rudius states that she will just have to turn him down. Rudius then leaves the two of them alone, and later he notices Cliff and Alina Lees acting lovey-dovey in the classroom. He is surprised to find out that they have become a couple, and Alina Lees mentions that Cliff's proposal was so manly that it made her heart skip a beat. Rudius asks her what she is going to do about her curse, and Alina Lee states that she would try to control herself as much as she can from now on. The season then changes to fall, and Rudius explains that beast men and women fight duels in fall, and the winners lead their families. He mentions that this is their form of a marriage proposal, and they are in heat. He states that since Linnea and Persina are princesses of the Doldia tribe, a lot of men adore them, and they are challenging them to duels. They wrote a letter to inform him that they won't be leaving their rooms, but their note also said that the rest is up to Rudius, and Rudius wonders what this means. The scene then cuts to Rudius receiving a challenge from a beast man, and he tries to run away telling him that he is straight, but the beast man stops him, and he mentions that he wrote to Lady Persina, and she informed him that he is the leader of their pack, and thus he is duty bound to accept all their challengers. Rudius understands that this is what the girls meant, and he easily defeats the beast man. Afterwards in the library, Fitz asks Rudius what he has done, as there is a huge line of beastmen outside, and Rudius explains the situation to him. Afterwards he goes outside, and he notices that all of the beastmen have been taken out by someone. The person states that he wanted to challenge Rudius as well, but he didn't like waiting for his turn so he defeated everyone ahead of him. He introduces himself as Batigati, the demon king, and he mentions that his fiancée Kishirika spoke highly of Rudius. He challenges Rudius to a duel, and a crowd gathers around them while Rudius waits for Fitz to fetch his staff. The two of them take a seat while they wait, and Batigati states that Kishirika said that Rudius is more marvelous than Laplace, and this must mean that his mana capacity is among the greatest in the world. Rudius wonders if it's true, and he mentions that he has been improving his mana capacity for a long time. Batigati states that even then it would be impossible for most people to achieve this much mana capacity and Rudius thinks that it might be because he reincarnated into this world. Rudius then asks Batigati if he has heard of the man-god, and Batigati states that he hasn't. Fitz then gives Rudius his staff, and Rudius asks Batigati to not kill him if he loses. Batigati is surprised that Rudius is begging for his life, even after he has that much mana, and Rudius mentions that two years ago he almost got killed by the dragon-god. This surprises Batigati and he suggests that Rudius should hit him with his most powerful blow, and if he manages to injure him then he will win, and if not then he will lose. Rudius accepts, and he charges a earth spell to attack Batigati. 
he fires it, and the attack sends Batigati flying. This does injure him, but he regenerates instantly, and he announces Rudius as the victor. Batigati then states that it's his turn, and he hits Rudius on the face. The scene then cuts to Fitz healing Rudius, and after he is done, he states that Rudius should rest for now, and he leaves. Rudius then thinks that he probably won't see Batigati again, and the next day while in class Persina and Linnea thank Rudius for taking care of the beastmen for them. Batigati then comes there, and Rudius finds out that he has joined the special class. The story continues, and while with Princess Ariel, Fitz stops to look at Rudius with Persina, and he wonders if this is the kind of girl that Rudius likes. Afterwards Ariel states that Fitz always stops to look at Rudius when he is around, and she wonders why he does that, when Rudius has completely forgotten who he is. Fitz states that he hasn't told him his name, and Luke can't believe this. Fitz explains that he is worried what he would do if Rudius doesn't remember him, and Ariel states that Sylphie can do whatever she wants about Rudius, and she can use the identity of Fitz in any way she likes. The scene then cuts to Rudius in the library, and he thinks that the mana disaster seems more like summoning, the more he reads into it. But there are differences, as you can't summon people. Rudius then notices Fitz, and he asks him if he knows any experts on summoning. Fitz states that he does, and he tells Rudius that it's the special student Silent Seven Star. Rudius thinks that he has heard that name, and they have improved many things in this school including dining hall menus to uniforms, and blackboards, and he recognizes most of these things from his old world. Rudius then states that he will go see them, and he goes to Seven Star's research lab. He notices that Seven Star is the girl named Nanahoshi that he saw with Orsted, and he runs away scared, and he faints. Afterwards Rudius wakes up in Fitz's laps, and he states that he had a strange dream about a woman in a white mask. He notices that Seven Star is still here, and she mentions that Rudius shouldn't be afraid of her, as she did save him the last time. Rudius asks her where Orsted is, and the girl mentions that Rudius can relax as she hasn't been with him for a while. Fitz then asks her how she knows Rudius, as he is so afraid of her, and Seven Star states that he might be recalling what the Dragon God did to him, the last time they met. Seven Star mentions that she didn't expect Rudius to turn up here, and she shows him Japanese written on paper, and she wonders if he recognizes this. Rudius states that he does, and they start talking in Japanese, and Fitz can't understand them. Seven Star then removes her mask, and Rudius notices that she has the same face as the girl he tried to save from the truck. Seven Star then tells him that her real name is Nanahoshi Shizuka, and she is Japanese. She gets excited seeing a fellow otherworlder, and she asks him all sorts of questions. Rudius introduces himself as Rudius Greyrat, and Nanahoshi states that this must be his alias, and she wonders what's his real name. She excitedly states that she is glad to see that she is not the only one sent here, and she mentions that they should go back to their world together. Rudius states that he doesn't want to go back to their world, and Nanahoshi puts on her mask, and she mentions that she has no interest in this world. Rudius then explains to her that they did come from the same world, but he was born here as a baby. Nanahoshi states that she was teleported, and she mentions that she was on her way back from school when a truck came for her and her friends. Rudius tells her that something similar happened to him, and the next thing he knew he was born as a baby. Nanahoshi states that she was dumped in the middle of the Azura Kingdom, and then Orsted took her in. Rudius wonders why he did that, and Nanahoshi states that she has no idea. Afterwards she spent two years learning the language, and later they went to journey around the world. Orsted had enemies everywhere, so fights were natural, and attacking Rudius was one of them, but Rudius seemed different than the others, so she asked Orsted to bring him back. Rudius then asks her why Orsted is at war with the man-god, and Nanahoshi mentions that she also doesn't know the details, and he said that it's a personal grudge. Nanahoshi then states that they traveled all over the world in a year to gather data on how to return to her world, and Rudius can't believe that they traveled the world in a year. Nanahoshi mentions that they used a special method, and she explains that they used teleportation circles left in some old ruins. Rudius wonders where these ruins are, and Nanahoshi states that she is not allowed to tell him that. Rudius then asks her if she found any leads, and Nanahoshi states that she didn't, but someone told her that she might have been summoned to this world by someone. Rudius wonders who, and Nanahoshi states that she can't tell him, as she was asked to stay silent. She then explains that they are foreign objects to this world, 
and if they do things to significantly alter history, then the world will erase them. This is why she only makes things that she needs, and she doesn't share them unless it benefits her. Rudius then notices that she is researching magic circles, and Nanahoshi states that she taught this to herself using books. She mentions that the people of this world are too set in their thinking, and they can't teach her what she is trying to do, since no one has done it before. She mentions that she also doesn't have any mana, and she finds out that Rudius does, and she thinks that this must be the difference between teleportation and reincarnation. She mentions that every single thing including dead bodies have mana, and she tells him that she has been living in this world for five years, but she doesn't seem to age. Rudius mentions that it must be nice, and Nanahoshi states that it's better than getting old in a foreign land. Nanahoshi mentions that this is her story, and she wonders if Rudius trusts her now. Rudius states that he does, and Nanahoshi mentions that they should make a deal in this case. She asks Rudius to help her with her experiments, and in return she will tell him what he wants to know. Rudius thinks about it for a moment, and he agrees to work with her. Nanahoshi then states that she heard that Rudius wants to know about the mana disaster, and Rudius wonders who told her about this. Nanahoshi states that it was Fitz, and Rudius asks her to continue in the local language now. Nanahoshi then explains that the mana disaster happened five years ago, when she arrived, and she thinks that the mass teleportation was just a backlash, and she might have been the cause of it. Fitz gets angry at Nanahoshi hearing this, and he tries to attack her, but Nanahoshi blocks his attack with the power of some magic rings. Rudius helps Nanahoshi, and he calms Fitz down. He explains that she is also a victim of the disaster, and Nanahoshi apologizes to him. Fitz understands, and he also apologizes for attacking her. Nanahoshi mentions that she also doesn't understand that incident, and she states that she has no idea what triggered it. If her work succeeds then she might be able to explain the mass teleportation, and for that she will be needing lots of mana. Rudius states that he understands, and he mentions that they should end this here for now. Afterwards Fitz asks Rudius what he thinks of Nanahoshi, and Rudius states that something about her rubs him the wrong way, but for now he trusts her. Fitz states that it's good to hear, and Rudius thanks him for worrying about him. The scene then cuts to Fitz noticing that Rudius is getting along with Nanahoshi, and he thinks that the two of them seem even closer than he was with Rudius back in Buena village. He wonders what he should do about this, and he wishes that someone could give him courage. Afterwards Rudius thinks that now he has been in this university for almost a year, and he is 16 now. He states that he begins his day with some daily practice, and nothing has changed with his schedule, but now Batigati hangs out with him every now and then. He thinks that he shouldn't piss him off, and he asks him if he knows a cure for impotence, but Batigati states that he doesn't. Rudius then states that after his training sessions, he has breakfast, and he goes to class. He mentions that people seem scared of him these days, after what went down with Batigati. The scene then cuts to Rudius in class, and Cliff asks him if he has learned anything about curses. Rudius thinks that Cliff has been asking this of him every day, and he tells him that he has heard that Laplace once transferred his curse into objects, and forced it onto a different tribe. He explains the whole story behind the supers, and Cliff thanks him for this. After class he has lunch, and he notices that the students in the dining area are talking about him. They say that Rudius has defeated every other student in the special class, and he also defeated the demon king with a single strike. Batigati then joins Rudius and the others, and they have lunch together. Rudius states that after this, he does magic experiments in a lab with Nanahoshi, and he just has to pour his magic into the circles that Nanahoshi comes up with. According to her, the most proven summoning circles are lost, but she studied their principles, and by experimenting with a lot of different circles she managed to invent a few original spells. She is trying to brute force a solution by testing more circles than one can count, and Rudius asks her what's the point of this. Nanahoshi mentions that it's to summon a person from their world, and Rudius thinks that if she can summon someone, she should be able to make a circle to send them back. This is what she hopes, and Rudius asks her if summoning another person won't cause another disaster. Nanahoshi mentions that she doesn't plan to let that happen, but if she can prove more theorems, she will be able to hypothesize why the disaster occurred. Rudius asks her to not take this lightly, and Nanahoshi mentions that she knows, and this is why she is starting from the basics. Rudius then states that he would also like to learn summoning magic, and Nanahoshi mentions that summoning is her lifeline, 
so she has to be careful about sharing it. Rudia states that she promised that she will teach him everything, and Nanahoshi mentions that she will tell him one thing after this experiment. Rudius thinks that this is hardly worth the effort, and Nanahoshi mentions that Rudius will get all of her results when the experiments are over, and she goes home. Rudius understands, and Nanahoshi states that he should do his own research if he is that eager to know. Rudius then states that after having dinner he gives magic lessons to Juliet, and they make figurines. Right now, Juliet's mana capacity is not enough, so she doesn't have finesse. She is good with her hands, but she only just started using sculpting tools, so her skills are still rough. Rudius then states that he hasn't been to the library as much ever since he met Nanahoshi, and this is how he spends his days right now. He thinks that he still hasn't discovered a cure for his condition, and he hasn't seen fits lately. One day Rudius receives a letter from Soldat, and he finds out that Soldat is in Sharia for a clan meetup. He has asked Rudius to have dinner together, and the scene then cuts to Rudius having dinner with Soldat, Alina Lees, and Cliff in a tavern. They talk about the old times, and Soldat then asks Alina Lees how she ended up with a boyfriend. Alina Lees states that this just shows that no man has been able to win her heart before now, but a wonderful gentleman has finally entered her life. She mentions that he might not believe her, but she can be quite devoted. Conrad then tells Soldat that they have another meeting planned for now, and Soldat tells Rudius that they should do this again, and he leaves. Rudius then asks Alina Lees where she is going to go now, and Alina Lees states that she is going to give Cliff a crash course in adventuring. Rudius asks them to not go anywhere dangerous, and he leaves the tavern. While returning to the academy he notices Fitz out shopping with Luke, and he wonders who is guarding Princess Ariel if the two of them are here. He goes to talk to them, but Fitz doesn't reply to him, and he notices that there is something different about Fitz today. He notices that Luke is also behaving differently, and he doesn't let Fitz talk at all. Luke mentions that Fitz doesn't speak while guarding the princess, and Rudius thinks that he might have come at a bad time, and he leaves. On his way back to the academy he wonders why Fitz was avoiding him, and he thinks that it kind of hurt. He thinks that he didn't do anything to offend Fitz, and he tries to find someone with whom he can talk about his feelings. He notices that Zenoba is not here, and Linnea and Persina won't be good listeners, and Nanahoshi already has her hands full with her research. After finding no one to talk with Rudius goes to the library to read a book, and he notices Fitz there. He notices that Fitz is his usual self, and he is talking with him normally, and he asks Fitz why he ignored him earlier. Fitz states that he is not allowed to speak when he is on duty, as people don't take him seriously because his voice sounds childish. He mentions that this is especially true when he is guarding the princess, and Rudius states that he didn't see the princess with him. Fitz states that she was in a shop nearby, and Rudius apologizes for talking to him at an inconvenient time. He then thinks that the person he met outside might have been Princess Ariel disguised as Fitz, and she avoided him because having a conversation could expose her. He thinks that this has to be it, and he leaves it at that. Afterwards in his room Rudius tries to make a figurine of Fitz, and he accidentally sculpts some breasts. He gets embarrassed, and he thinks that he can't stop thinking about Fitz. He realizes that he has fallen in love with him, and afterwards he notices Fitz passing by him with the princess, and he can't believe that he is in love with a man. Later Rudius goes to Vice Principal Genius to ask him about Fitz, but Genius states that his superiors have asked him to not speak of Fitz. Rudius then asks about the gender of Fitz, and Genius mentions that he is male. Rudius then thinks that he wasn't able to find anything, and it seems like someone is putting pressure on the vice principal. The scene then cuts to Rudius in the library, and he wonders what he is going to do if Fitz turns out to be a woman. Fitz then comes there, and this startles Rudius, and he falls along with Fitz. After touching Fitz Rudius finds out that Fitz is actually a girl, and Fitz denies this and she leaves. Rudius then thinks that Fitz really is a girl, and he notices that there is a reaction from his manly parts. Rudius wonders why Fitz wants to hide her gender, and he thinks that he will keep treating her as a man if this is what she wants. He thinks that Fitz definitely has the key to curing his ED, but he can't get any more intimate with her right now. He then notices that his manly parts have calmed down once more and he thinks that his cure is still far from complete. The next day Rudius wonders how he can completely cure himself, and he comes across Luke. Luke states that they need to talk about Fitz, and Rudius tells him that he knows nothing. 
Luke asks him if he is sure, and Rudy states that he has no intention of opposing any of them. He doesn't know Fitz's identity, and Luke wonders why he is willing to feign ignorance for them. Rudy states that he has cut his ties with both the Notos and the Boreas, and he is afraid to challenge Luke, and he runs away saying that they should leave it at that. He thinks that he has decided to not make trouble for Fitz, but this isn't easy. Afterwards Ariel summons Fitz, and we see that she knows that Rudius has found out that Fitz is a woman. She mentions that even still he refuses to reveal her identity, and this must mean that he wants to do right by Fitz. Ariel states that she admires his devotion, and she wonders what Fitz is going to do about this. She mentions that she doesn't mind winning Rudius over to their cause slowly, but she has to speak up as there has been no progress in the last six months. She states that she has grown tired of waiting, and she asks Fitz to reveal her real identity to him. Fitz is unsure about this, and Ariel tells her that she shouldn't hold back for her sake. She mentions that Fitz can leave her if she has found what she wants to do, and Fitz states that this would be betrayal. Ariel states that it won't, and she wonders what Fitz wants to do right now. Fitz states that she wants to be with Rudius, but if he doesn't remember her, then she will never recover from this. Ariel mentions that they should think this through then, and Luke states that simply revealing herself as Sylphie seems like the best course of action. He thinks that Rudius might have forgotten about her, since he hasn't remembered her till now, and Ariel asks her if she has any strong memories with Rudius. Fitz tells her the memory of Rudius saving him, and the two of them trying to take a bath together, and afterwards Ariel asks Fitz what kind of relationship she wants to have with Rudius. Fitz then reveals her sexual fantasies to Princess Ariel, and Ariel states that she has a plan, but its success will completely depend on Fitz. If she fails this plan due to her nerves then she will use her authority to forbid her from having any further contact with Rudius. Fitz understands, and Ariel tells her the plan. The scene then cuts to Fitz talking with Rudius alone, and she mentions that she wants to ask Rudius for a favor. She tells him that another noble bragged to Princess Ariel about her bodyguard, and they said that with just a party of four their guard can fetch a flower that only grows deep in the forest of hail. Rudius thinks that she might be talking about the flower freeze fringe, and Fitz states that Princess Ariel told them that Fitz could do this with an even smaller group. Rudius states that he will ask some adventurers to cut Fitz a deal on that flower, and Fitz mentions that this wouldn't be right, as Princess Ariel would lose face if she were found out. Rudius then suggests a few more options, but Fitz doesn't like any of them. She suggests that Rudius should go with him to get that flower, as it would be easy for the two of them. Rudius accepts, and they leave for the forest. While in the forest, Rudius burns a path through the snow for them to walk on, and he asks Fitz to keep an eye out for threats. Fitz then asks Rudius about his staff, and she states that it's amazing. Rudius mentions that a noblewoman he tutored gave this to him on his tenth birthday, and Fitz asks Rudius if she can hold it, as she wants to try it out. Rudius gives it to her, and while Rudius walks ahead Fitz uses a magic ring to bring rain clouds above them. Rudius notices this, and Fitz tells him that they should stop somewhere, but Rudius states that he can clear this in no time. Rudius tries to clear the clouds, but Fitz uses a spell to bring them back using Rudius's staff, and Fitz thinks that she borrowed the staff so that Rudius couldn't use it, but it ended up helping her instead. It then starts to rain, and Rudius mentions that there is a cave above, and they go there. Rudius then thinks that the clouds moved too fast when the rain came, and he thinks that someone might have cast a spell on them. He notices that Fitz is tense, and he thinks that she might also have realized this. Rudius then dries off his clothes, and he notices that Fitz is shaking with cold due to her wet clothes. He acts like a gentleman, and he tells Fitz to dry her clothes while he closes his eyes. Fitz does nothing, and Rudius wonders if she would like for him to create a private room for her. He states that he can also leave the cave, and he tries to leave, but Fitz stops him. Rudius states that she will catch a chill like this, and Fitz mentions that he is right. She states that somehow, she can't take off her clothes, and she asks Rudius to undress her. Rudius proceeds to do that, and he mentions that he knows that Fitz is a woman. Fitz states that she knows this, and she asks him to remove her clothes. Rudius removes her clothing one by one, and he thinks that he has seen those blushing ears somewhere before. He thinks that something similar has happened once before, and Rudius then removes Fitz's sunglasses. After seeing her face, he asks her if her real name is Sylphie, 
and Fitz states that it is. Sylphie then hugs Rudius, and she cries. Rudius thinks that she is still a crybaby, and Sylphie tells him that she loves him, and she asks him to never leave her again. Rudius wonders how he was not able to recognize her until now, and he thinks that his impressions of Fitz and Sylphie were just too different. Unlike Sylphie Fitz was too level-headed, and he thinks that if he doesn't tell her how he feels right now, then she will go away again. He thinks that he doesn't want any more regrets, and he tells Sylphie that he loves her as well. He then kisses her, and he tries to go further with her, but he notices that his manly parts aren't responding to this sudden development. Afterwards Rudius apologizes to Sylphie for this, and he mentions that he has been like this for the last three years. He apologizes for embarrassing her, and Sylphie asks him to stop, as she is not ashamed. Rudius then thanks Sylphie for the pendant she made for him, and she is glad that Rudius has this with him. Rudius then asks her why she disguises herself as a boy, and Sylphie explains to Rudius the whole story about how she was teleported to the royal palace, and how she met Princess Ariel. She mentions that after they ended up at the Renoa Magic Academy, she saw Rudius's name on the list of new potential students, and this made her happy. She was surprised when Rudius didn't recognize her, and Rudius apologizes to her, and he mentions that Sylphie should have said something sooner. Sylphie states that she couldn't work up the courage, and Rudius apologizes for taking a whole year to realize this. Rudius then notices her smiling, and he gets a response from his manly parts, and he thinks that thanks to Sylphie, he is on the mend. The two of them go to the university, and Sylphie states that she will leave now as she has business to tend to, and Rudius hopes that he will see more of her now. Sylphie states that she would like that, and Rudius leaves. Sylphie then wishes that she had a medicine to cure Rudius, and the scene cuts to her telling Princess Ariel and Luke about everything. Ariel laughs after finding out that Rudius is here to cure his impotence, and she thinks that she might have underestimated Rudius. Luke says that there are times when a man just can't help it, and he is sure that Rudius didn't fail to make love to Sylphie by choice. He mentions that he now understands why he's been docile this whole time, and his manner and expressions make sense to him now. He states that Rudius might have come here as a last resort, and Ariel apologizes for her earlier comment. Luke then asks Sylphie if she wants to cure Rudius, and Sylphie states that Rudius had an awful shock, so she wants to do whatever she can for him. Luke tells her that he has something for her if this is the case, and he goes to get something. Meanwhile Ariel tells Sylphie about some techniques to get a man in the mood, and Luke returns, and he mentions that her techniques won't work as Sylphie doesn't have the body for feminine wiles, and this surprises Sylphie. Luke then shows her an aphrodisiac, and it's the same one that Eris once gifted Rudius. He mentions that this was once made in Fitoa, but the method in place of its production has been lost due to the mass teleportation. Due to this its current price is over a hundred gold coins, and he planned to sell this if they ever needed funds in an emergency. He gives it to Sylphie, and Sylphie hesitates to take it due to its value, but Luke convinces her. He mentions that any man who drinks this will lose all control, and Sylphie should drink some herself if she fears not being able to keep up. With this her first time won't be as sweet as she has envisioned, and Sylphie thanks Luke for it. Ariel then gives Sylphie two gold coins, and she mentions that this is her spending money for the month. She wishes Sylphie luck, and Sylphie thanks her. The scene then cuts to Sylphie going to Rudius's room at night, and she tells him that she is here to spend the night. Rudius is surprised to hear this, and they both take a seat. Rudius asks her what she has with him, and Sylphie states that it's something to celebrate their reunion. Rudius then brings some cups, and they both drink the wine that Sylphie brought with her. They talk about the old times, and Sylphie then shows the aphrodisiac to Rudius. She mentions that it's a medicine to fix Rudius, and Rudius thinks that he has seen this before. Sylphie tells Rudius to drink it, and Rudius does so without any hesitation. Sylphie then takes off her jacket, and she mentions that Rudius doesn't have to hold back once it kicks in. Sylphie drinks a bit of the aphrodisiac as well, and the both of them start to feel hot. Rudius then takes her to bed, and they make love to each other. The next morning Rudius wakes up on his bed alone, and he remembers that this was the aphrodisiac that the peddler in Roa was selling. He notices blood on his sheets, and he gets sad seeing that Sylphie is not here. He thinks that she must have guard duty, and Sylphie comes to his room. She mentions that she just went to thank Princess Ariel and Luke for yesterday, and she states that they are both overjoyed. 
Rudius then hugs her, and Sylphie tells him that she is not going anywhere. Rudius then touches her chest, and he notices that he has been cured. He cries, and he thanks Sylphie. The scene then cuts to Rudius meeting the princess, and Ariel asks him what brings him here. Rudius states that he heard that the princess helped Sylphie in curing his illness, and he asks her if there is anything he can do for her. Luke mentions that he thought that Rudius is shying away from power struggles between Azure and nobles, and Rudius states that this is true, and he doesn't want to be caught up in power politics, but if her dear Sylphie is already caught in one, then it changes things. Ariel states that she will be glad to receive his support, and she wonders what he plans to do now. Rudius mentions that he has a duty to find family members lost in the mass teleportation, so he can't set out for Azura quite yet. Ariel states that her affairs can wait until Rudius has resolved his own, and she wonders if Rudius is just going to leave Sylphie behind to find his family, now that he has been cured of his impotence. Rudius mentions that he will marry her, and Sylphie is surprised to hear this. Ariel asks her what she is going to do, and Sylphie asks Rudius to take good care of her. Rudius asks her the same, and Ariel states that Sylphie doesn't need to dress as a man if she is going to be Rudius's wife. She states that in exchange for this she is going to make use of Rudius's reputation, and Rudius can also use her name. Rudius understands, and Sylphie returns her sunglasses to Princess Ariel. Both Sylphie and Rudius then thank Luke and the princess, and this marks the end of part 1. Thanks for watching, part 2 will be on my channel as soon as it releases, so look forward to it. Please like and share the video if you enjoyed it, and make sure to hit the subscribe button, and turn on the notification bell to keep getting new anime recap updates.